Assalamu alaikum, you're watching Just Law. In this program we discuss legal matters and we invite guests to assist us with your questions. Um, we have then Madiha Dani who deals with employment and Islamic wills matters and she'll be assisting uh, today with our questions. Uh, viewers, you can ask questions on family, immigration, employment and Islamic wills. You can also ask questions on um, business matters or general contract questions because Madiha also deals with those. Um, so I have a few questions of my own inshallah and then we'll open the phone lines for your questions. You can ask your questions today in English, you can ask in Urdu, um, Madiha understands Urdu. You can also ask your questions in Bengali and in Arabic. Apunara Banglai, Prosno Korte Parven. Mumkin Tasalu Asila Tukum inshallah, Beluga al Arabia. And Madiha, if you just tell them, they can ask questions in Urdu as well. And Okay, thank you for that. Um, I have a few questions of my own. Um, I, I read in the news that there was this American lady who converted to Islam uh, two years ago. And one year ago, she told her airline, she's an air hostess, um, that I can't serve alcohol because that's prohibited in my religion. And what the company said is, that's fine. What we will do is any alcohol requests will be dealt with by another air hostess. And this worked fine for about a year. And then recently, uh, another air hostess complained saying, why is she not serving alcohol? And now she's been suspended. Mm. Um, I just wanted to know if someone cannot do a particular task because of their religious beliefs, is that something that the employer is required to accommodate? Or I mean, how, 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 do, how does it work? Um, the, it could be seen as direct or indirect even discrimination in this case. So there's a requirement in place um, which certain people can't fulfill. And in this case, it would be, I guess, Muslims, if they're practicing Muslims and they're abiding by not serving alcohol. So if that applied here in the UK, um, it, there could be a potential affecting who's not. Right. I mean, if we talk about Jumma, if we talk about fasting in Ramadan, if we talk about taking eight days off, yeah. if we talk about not serving alcohol mm. and other prohibited items, yeah. um, does the employer actually have a duty? I mean, they could say, look, um, this is our business, this is what we do, and the contract says, it's a, you know, if we make a reasonable request, you have to comply. I mean, you know, when someone starts their job uh, at an employer, they know what sort of duties they're going to do. In this case, obviously, she reverted to Islam during her employment. Um, so you've got a choice as to whether or not you accept a job in the first place. So um, in relation to the defence from the employer, their defence would be, well, this is, this, is, this is the job, this is what we're doing. We're not um, discriminating against you particularly because everyone else is going to be doing the same thing. And, you know, that's a reasonable sort of defence that they could put forward. But, you know, obviously it, is, it comes down to the tribunal as to whether they would consider something like that to be discrimination. Um, there has been some similar cases here in the UK as well, but it's still one of these areas which I think needs to be, you know, further explored as to which way the tribunals would I mean, go. In, in your line of work, mm. uh, where would you say, what would be regarded as a reasonable accommodation by the employer? Mm. So, oh, for example, I, I can remember one case, even in the 60s, where somebody said, look, I need two hour lunch break for my Jummah prayers. Mm. And the employer agreed. And so that's how it continued. That was one of the conditions of taking up the employment. Yeah. Um, so if it's agreed at the outset, um, surely the employee can argue that this was something that was agreed mm. and it should be honoured. If it's been agreed from the onset um, and then the employer changes their mind, and in this case it seems like something similar has happened, then that could be seen as a breach of contract on the employer, you know, employer's part because they've agreed something and then they've gone back and said, no, actually we want it like that. Unless they can argue there's a good business reason for it now. Um, it doesn't sound like it because it's just someone else has complained and said something, but I don't think that's justified. So in this case, it could be that there's actually a breach of contract because her contract is now that she doesn't have to serve alcohol. So, you know, I think she, she would have a potential case. If she was in the UK, obviously the American laws may be different. I think there was a case, wasn't there, about sort of having religious symbols mm. and so forth. And it's a lot about 
getting the balance mm. so that the employer gets the work done yeah. and the employee is able to continue practicing their faith. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think for the employers, they have, to, they have to come across as reasonable. What is reasonable is the, the difficulty, isn't it? Because it can depend on various things, like how big is the employer? Um, you know, what sort of resources do they have? Can they accommodate it? Or are they just being unreasonable for the sake of being unreasonable? So right. you have to look at certain things. And it also comes down to things like, you know, when someone's got a disability, then the employer has a duty to make reasonable adjustments. But again, what does reasonable mean? It depends on lots of factors, including, you know, d does the company, you know, can they afford to do certain things? You know, mm -hmm. if it's a, a tiny little company and you've got an issue with your back, then you can't get them to buy a £5,000 chair. Do you see? But if it's like you're working for a big company and, you know, they've got... I, I think I've, I've watched the reports on the US one and I know mm -hmm. US law is different than yeah. British or the U English mm -hmm. law. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about how difficult it will be for the employer mm. to accommodate this particular need. Right. And they're saying if you were on a small plane and you were the only air hostess mm. and someone made requests for alcohol and you yeah. said you can't provide that, mm. then the employer obviously has a difficulty now. Yeah. Of course, from a Muslim perspective, we'll say, well, maybe you shouldn't sell alcohol on planes, mm. but that's, uh, that's not a legal position. Mm. Um, in, in, in terms of um, if something was agreed, and the situation changed later. Yeah. Um, you're saying they will have a greater possibility of saying this is a reasonable business choice. So we need the person to accommodate and do that. Mm. Well, I would say that if they've accepted it, then that becomes part of their contract. So right. it's almost like if your contract says you have to come in at nine o'clock every morning, you come in at 9.30, no one says anything, it's, it, the employer's accepted you to come in at 9.30, that's now your contract. So if they suddenly start enforcing the nine o'clock rule, it's gonna be very difficult for them because they've accepted for you to come in at 9.30 for the last year. So now your, you know, your contract is 9.30. Do you see? Because even though- it So the may practice be, has overridden what yeah. was so in, custom in writing. Can, yeah, so custom can also, custom and practice can also form part of your contract, not necessarily what's written in the contract. Right, interesting. Yeah. interesting. Uh, viewers, we are discussing employment law. Uh, we are discussing as the rights and responsibilities of the employer versus the needs of the employee. Uh, there was a, a Muslim revert in the US suspended uh, from her job uh, because she refused to serve alcohol. The background was that two years ago she converted to Islam. One year ago she realized serving alcohol is prohibited, and so she asked her employer if she could not serve alcohol. The employer said, fine. You know, other hostesses would do that, and so she didn't have to. Um, recently, she was suspended, saying right, and she needed to do it. Um, so, inshallah, if you are um, you know, this sort of is something that you, you have experienced, or you know somebody who has gone through where the employer is required to accommodate, or you've thought to accommodate something, and they've come back and said, no, we're not going to do that. Um, it's always useful to see where the lines are drawn. What, you know, what is reasonable. If you request it, inshallah, you get it. Uh, perhaps you'll enjoy your work a bit more. You'll find you know, you're valued. Um, I mean, would you say that employers who accommodate more, um, I mean, again, this is not a legal question, mm. but of course, giving the employee more room to maneuver would mean the employee will work harder and stay in longer. Yeah, I mean, just it's just. I mean, if you logic, put too many pressures, it? if yeah. someone is working in a, in a supermarket and they're forced to serve alcohol and it's haram, mm. then you know they may then look elsewhere and say, yeah. you know, I need to well, stop. Well, they're going to be obviously happy in in the job role. So yeah, it is really for the employers to consider these. The needs of the, the employees needs. and, yeah, and exactly. ways to accommodate that. Yeah. Okay, here, um, viewers, you can call in and ask your questions. Inshallah, we are discussing family, immigration, employment. Um, Islamic wills, uh, business contracts, etc. So you can call in and ask your question, inshallah. Um, the number is on the screen, so you can call in. Uh, you can email us at justlaw at ikra.tv and inshallah uh, we'll go through those and respond to you. Um, I have one more question in relation yeah. to uh, employment and how it sort of tallies with immigration. Um, when someone's immigration leave has, is about to expire, usually they apply to have it renewed. So there is this time where it could be three months, could be six months, where this person doesn't have 
a visa that says they can work or reside here. Um, that's usually dealt with by having what we call pending applications. You've got a, a weighted application. Now, recently, some employers, because there is a £20,000 potential fine for employing someone who's not entitled to work, um, they're quick to sort of say, right, unless I have this particular document, I'm not going to let you work. Now, under the rules, if they have a pending application, all the rights and the responsibilities they enjoyed prior to the application continues mm. until the new application is decided or is exhausted. But in your experience, you find some employers are very quick and they yeah. say, look, get me this document or we're going to suspend you. Or mm. Yeah, I mean, I've had some similar cases. So the application, we've made the application for our client. Um, before their visa expires, um, but they've still been actually dismissed from their job. Um, and it's only because the Home Office hasn't provided the document, there's something called the Certificate of Application, which confirms that they have the right to work. That will be done in a European context. In, in that context, In, in, in yeah. the non-European context, they will just get an acknowledgement. Right, okay, so again, the documentation hasn't been there to the satisfaction of the employer, and they've basically been dismissed. Um, and it has been unfortunate, actually, because they do actually have the right to work. Um, and it seems the employer, they do a home office check verification. They have a checking system. And on that, there seems to be either some sort of delay or something which doesn't really, you know, correspond with the home office. You know. Well, home office sometimes have an interesting position mm. where they say we're unable to confirm. Yeah. So they're not saying the person has the right to work or mm. no right to work. Mm. They just say we don't know. Well, I've so that begs the question I've whether the Home had, Office doesn't know. It's true. Um, well, I've actually had, they've done the checking system and it shows that they don't have the right to work. So it's simply, you know, they just don't have it. Um, and we've provided... Well, on, on, on the facts, they should. So yeah. there is some problem with the system itself. Well, yeah, on the facts, because as we said with the EU law, that there isn't actually a requirement for... Well, yes. with the EU. Well, in the EEA, if you're a family yeah. member, mm. um, then it's, it's almost like an inherent right. So if yeah. you can establish your connection to the European... Mm. If the European is exercising treaty rights, mm. then having the documents is somewhat voluntary. But of course, yeah. an employer would still want to see those documents. They have documents. their own policies. That's the so, issue. Yeah. So it, the right is inherent, but to be able to establish that, obviously, mm. they have to make an application and, and wait a response. Mm. And they have the interim measure, which is uh, the certificate of application. Yeah. So while the matter has been decided, usually, if it's a direct family member, they do confirm the right to work. Yeah. But you're right, sometimes the system doesn't work. Even though they have right to work, it will come up with negative when mm. the employer checking service is used. Yeah, and by that time, the person's been dismissed. And, um, you know, the only really cause of action is to either, well, you can make, obviously make another application and join the employer if they'll accept it, but otherwise you could make a claim to the tribunal. And there has been some people that have been successful, um, you know, in these sort of cases where it's been seen as unfair dismissal. Um, also, I think there is an element where um, if the lawyers get involved um, and explain the situation to the employer, um, it can be resolved. So I think advice mm. to the viewers is, you know, seek legal advice, yeah. and make, make sure that the employer is uh, adequately addressed on the issues. Mm. Because the, uh, the employer is not really, not all employers are legally trained, sure. so they may overreact. Mm. Because they don't want to breach the law fined, or get yeah. fined, etc. Mm. Yeah. Okay, um, viewers, um, do you have any experience on this issue? Have you sort of not lost your job, but have you been affected by waiting for a decision from the Home Office or you know, applied for extension? Uh, please do call in and ask us, inshallah. Share your story. You don't have to give us your name or any other. Um, but it will be useful uh, here sort of on the subject. Um, the number is on the screen, you can call in. Um, you, today you can ask in your questions in Bengali, Urdu, Arabic, and of course English. Um, the other thing I, I, I would want to ask is, what happens to, if someone is suspended, say for two weeks, because their papers hasn't come through, mm -hmm. can they make a claim? Because later on the issue is settled. They, they, they have, you know, got the certificate of application or an acknowledgement. Is there anything that can be done about the interim period? Well, while they're suspended, they should be getting paid full pay. Right. So they haven't suffered any loss. Right. So there wouldn't really be much, there wouldn't be a claim in those circumstances. 
So, uh, so if they're then... But if someone's on a zero-hour contract, then they won't really get any payment. Or if someone is sort of like an mm. employee, but they only get paid for the hours. If they're the on hours. a zero-hour contract, it's more, most likely they won't get suspended. They'll just... Like, Not get any work. Yeah, the contract signed. will just... Yeah, and there wouldn't be a breach of the law. So um, it's just when you suffer loss and, and under those circumstances, you would be getting paid for salary. I mean, I think for the employer, that's probably the most, the safest option. Um, obviously, the suspension, you don't want to be paying them for a, a long period of time. But that, you know, is a way that they can sort of try and avoid either a claim, obviously, coming one way or the fine coming the other way. Uh, let's turn to the viewers. Assalamu alaikum. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, there is Hello? Hello, Sarko. Well, I just need to ask a question. Okay, what's your question, please? Uh, what it is, is that my daughter-in-law, uh, she arrived... Yeah, go on. Uh, what it is, is that she arrived... Uh, you know when you get your visa mm -hmm. for um, entry visa, spouse visa, right? You get your spouse visa and you come into the country, but she came a bit delayed because she was applying for a British passport for her uh, for her son. Okay. So every so so the, by the time she entered the country, it was uh, it was delayed. Right. Entry. So are, are we talking on? I mean, did she travel after two thousand and twelve, or when did she travel? Um. Was it recent in the last two years, three when years? When did you travel? Did you travel after 2012? Yes, yes, after 2012. So she would be under the new rules, which is that when she applies... No, no, it wasn't under the new rules. I remember that. She was given... Uh, it's not under the new rules because we made the application much, much earlier. But because yeah. there was a delay in the process, uh, you know, by the time she arrived there, because she was pregnant, she she had the baby in Pakistan, and then she arrived here. So we had to apply for an extension. Mm -hmm. So now that we've applied for the extension, um, can she, in, in you know, so her two-year qualifying period it finishes in August. I mean, finished in August. Okay. So your question is, if someone came on a spouse visa under the old rules, which was uh, the rules before 9th of July 2012, where they gave you two and a half years plus three months, so they gave 27 months visa. If your daughter-in-law has the 27 months visa, that visa was going to expire, but she hadn't completed the 24 months that was required. So she applied for an extension and they've given her an extension. Now she doesn't yeah, have to go through the full extension. As soon as she qualifies, and she has been in the UK for 24 months and her husband meets the requ financial requirements um, yeah, and, but, and she meets the requirements, what, what, she can what apply. What I'm trying to say is that, does she apply for the two year that finishes in... in uh, does she have to wait for the extension? No, no, because the extension was just to give her time to meet the two, two year requirement. So, if so she it's met, only the two year requirement that she has to complete. If she's on the old rules, then she would be entitled to apply after the 24 months has expired. And you're telling me that in August this year, her 24 months has been completed. So she can oh, apply sorry, for... Sorry, I'm getting confused there. Sorry. Okay, I, I will just recap for you. Okay. Because if someone you know, came... I'm trying to listen to the, to the television and trying to listen no, to... No, no, no. If you put the television down, so just listen to myself. Um, so because she applied under the old rules, which were available before 9th of July 2012, when she has been in the UK for two years, she can apply for indefinite under the old rules. Now, oh, okay. if she has applied for extension, they don't give you extension for six months, eight months. They give you extension for perhaps, you know, two years, two and a half years, etc. Yeah, that's so, what they've done. They've given yeah, you extension yeah. so for So because she's now switching from being a spouse to being indefinite, um, the only time you cannot apply before your visa expires is if you're applying for an extension. Then the 28 days would apply. So if she was extending, they won't allow her to extend three months before the expiry date. It will be 28 days before the expiry. So in this case, as soon as she has completed two years, if she meets all the other requirements, she should apply. Okay? Okay. Thank you very much. But of course, double check before when she's ready to apply, double check that she meets all the requirements, not just this particular one. 
Okay. Can I just ask one more question? Go it's on. regarding housing. Uh, okay. Because um, uh, my uh, my brother was supporting uh, them for housing, and what it is, my brother has to sell his house for his personal reasons. So, can they go on housing benefits? Um, I think the simple answer to that is that when they're making an application, uh, claiming any benefit, any estate benefit, is likely to have an impact. So oh, if they're not claiming already, I would say make the application, make no, sure everything is in place. They're not if, claiming. If, 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 if your son is earning above the 18,600, etc., I would say make the application on that basis. Um, and then once the application is successful, uh, then you know all the other things can be dealt with. Because introducing uh, state benefits may complicate matters. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So um, you know it's it's been three years. So some people who came late, mm -hmm. the old rules may still apply. Um, and the Home Office they sort of change things every two three months. They change the form. They change the questions. So it's always useful to sort of double check before before, you make the before taking actions. In fact, for the viewers' benefits, um, now they don't give you the two and a half year visa okay. in Pakistan or in Bangladesh or abroad. What they do is they give you a 30 day visa hmm. and you have to come in within the 30 days. And you have to provide an address in the UK. And it's the address in the UK where they send the biometric card. Right, okay. And so once they're here, they need the biometric card. Hmm. Um, the, the, the sticker will not do. So what happens after the 30, so you, you come with So they have to days. come in within the 30 days. Yeah. And then once they're here, mm -hmm. they'll be given the biometric card. And how long does that? That will be for the duration oh, that is duration. advertised. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think what the Home Office is trying to do is do away with the uh, paper visas. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, there's a new EU directive, which is forcing everyone to go biometric. Okay. Because um, there was confusion about person's name, date of birth, and changing things. Whereas mm -hmm. biometric, they know who you are regardless of your name or date of birth. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if I can touch, we've got a couple of minutes before the break, um, the whole EU migration mm. situation. Now, your main sort of focus is on employment. Yeah. Now, if, if, if a migrant was to come here and they're given right of work, etc., they settle in and they, you know, they're working, um, from your experience, is, 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 you know, is it easy for them to sort of, I mean, do they have more risk of having employers taking a disadvantage sort of view saying, well, we're not sure about your entitlement? Mm. Well, if they're claiming asylum, which I think a lot of these people would be, um, they wouldn't be entitled to work during, you know, the... That's not entirely true, but, okay. uh, you know, if you apply asylum, you can ask for right to work. You, you can, do. but generally... Um, Unless you make the application to apply, but you wouldn't be entitled to work. It, it, that, that, yeah. that really depends on what's granted. But if someone's mm. an asylum seeker and they haven't applied for right mm. to work, mm. that, then that could be complicated. Well, mm. viewers, um, we are going to go to a break, inshallah, soon. Um, we are discussing employment matters, immigration, family, Islamic wills, etc. I have Madi Hadani, who is a solicitor, who is going to assist us with the questions. Um, we are going to go for a break, inshallah. But before I do, I want to remind you, if you are watching at home and you have a question, want to ask, please do. Um, so, inshallah, I will see you on the other side of the break. Until then, stay with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.